God is far more interested in changing your mind than in changing your circumstances. We want God to change our circumstances. We want him to take away all the problems, all the pain, all the sorrow, all the suffering, all the sickness, all the sadness. And God says, yeah, yeah, I know that's important, but really more important than that is what's happening in you. And I'm far more interested in changing your mind before we change your circumstance. Because nothing happens in your life until you get the renewing of your mind. No transformation takes place. No change takes place in your mind or in your life until your thoughts begin to change. Look at the next verse, 2 Corinthians 10. Though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. In other words, because he's talking about the mental battle we're going through. Our weapons have divine power to demolish strongholds. Circle the word stronghold. We'll come back to that word in just a minute. Our weapons have the divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish any argument and every pretension. That's the arguments in your own mind, the pretensions in your own mind that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And here's the important part. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We take captive. And the word in Greek is akmalotizo, and it, means, it literally means to conquer. It means to bring under control. It means to capture. We, we take captive. We, we conquer like a country. We akmalotizo a country. And then the other phrase in one circle, he says, we make it obedient. We take it captive, every thought captive, and we make, every, we make it obedient, make every thought obey Christ. And that word there, uh, literally, make it obedient, hupakoe means to bring into submission. How do you do that? Let's just have a little confession here. My thoughts often disobey me. They often rebel. My mind often has a mind of its own. It wants to go in another direction. This morning, I was studying for this message. My mind didn't want to study. It wanted to sit down with a big sandwich, some jalapeno potato chips, okay, piece of mud pie, I'm making you all hungry now here. See, see, what, see what I'm doing? I'm, men, I'm messing with your mind, okay? Okay, you're all already salivating on that kind of stuff right there. You know, and if you got ADD or ADHD, your mind often goes off in a whole different direction. And you get ready to pray and you're going, what do I say? I don't know, I don't have anything to say. You got anything to say, Lord? I don't have anything to say. Is anybody identifying with this? Okay. And you go, I don't know, you know, I'm supposed to pray. What do I pray? Or, uh, hello, God. Amen. <laughs> my mind often rebels. When I need to ponder, my mind wants to wander. It doesn't always obey me. When I need to pray, my mind drifts away. Yeah. He says, we take captive, we make it obedient. What's he saying here is, you have a choice. Your mind has to listen to you. And your will, God didn't give you just a mind, he gave you a will and emotions. We're gonna talk about emotions next week. But part of your will is to bring your mind into order. Now the reason why most people are ineffective in life and actually fail at life and actually don't enjoy life is because they've never learned how to fight the battle of the mind. This is so important. I intend to teach an entire series on it this year. We're gonna go into this in detail. I'm only doing one message on it, 50 Days of Transformation. But today, I just wanna to explain to you one simple thing, how temptation works. Because Paul says, we're not supposed to be ignorant of how Satan works. We need to know how it works so you're not caught off guard. So let me explain to you how temptation works. Because it always uses the same pattern. James 1, 14 and 15 tells us the pattern. 
Temptation comes from the lure of our own evil desires. And these evil desires lead to evil actions. And then the evil actions lead to death. Now notice, temptation is a process. It's not an isolated event. You know when people talk about, I don't know, it just caught me off guard. It was just a one night stand. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. There were a lot of things that you gave into before you got to lowering that barrier. Temptation is a process, and the Bible describes exactly how it, and there are four phases. Write these down. Phase number one is temptation starts with desire. So number one is desire. If you don't have any desire for something, it's not a temptation. I have never, ever in my life been tempted to smoke a cigarette. Why? There's no desire in me. I think they stink. Okay? Somebody asked me one day, will smoking send you to hell? I said, no. Make you smell like you've been there, but it, it won't. <laughs> but it, it's not going to send you to hell, okay? All right? I, do you remember when they used to have smoking on airplanes? I, that was terrible. I had, a, I had a friend who used to carry a card with him. And when a guy would light up next to him on the plane, he, he'd hand him the card and it said, I notice you smoke. Well, I chew. If you won't blow smoke on me, I won't spit on you. <laughs> now, I've never been tempted because I, it just didn't smell good to me. Now, there's a lot of other stuff I've been tempted in that you haven't been tempted in. But it always starts with an internal desire. Now, he says there, the lure of our desire. It begins inside you. Temptation doesn't start out there. It doesn't start on TV. It doesn't start on the street corner. It starts inside your mind. And it often begins with a natural desire, not even an evil desire. It can begin with a natural desire. You have a natural desire for sleep. You have a natural desire for water. You have a natural desire for food. You have a natural desire for sex. You have a natural desire to succeed in life. These are all God-given drives. The drive to achieve, the drive for sex, the drive to breathe, the drive, those are normal drives. There's nothing wrong with them, okay? Listen closely. Temptation turns a routine desire into a runaway desire. And that's what makes it bad. It becomes more important than anything else. It's all you can think about. And any desire out of control is destructive. Fire in a fireplace can warm. Fire on a cooking stove can cook great food. But fire uncontrolled can burn your house down. All of God's gifts misused and abused will burn your house down. Any of them will. Sex, sleep, eating, any of those things. They're good desires, good drives, but misused and abused, they, they, uh, they mess you up. Now often temptation is an attempt to fulfill a legitimate desire in your life, like I just want to be loved. There's nothing wrong with that in the wrong way. But the point is, it's like steel and a magnet. If there were no desire in me, there would be no temptation. Does that make sense? Okay, so temptation doesn't start out there. It starts in here, in my mind, with desire. Step two in temptation, always happens this way, is doubt. And what you do in doubt is you begin to doubt two things. You doubt that God loves you, and you doubt that God knows best. Because when you start to get tempted, you go, did God really say, don't have sex outside of marriage? Did God really say, forgive the person instead of get even with them? Did God really say, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And you start doubting God's word. We see this from the very first temptation in Adam and Eve. They're in a perfect environment, okay? It's, it's paradise. They have no clothes and no kids. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> How do you mess up that? Really? <laughs> Satan comes and says, hey, see that tree over there? Did God really say you can't eat of that tree? 
What is he doing? He's getting you to doubt God's word. And then he says, God knows that if you eat that tree, you'll be as smart as he is. What's he doing? He's getting you to doubt that God loves you, that God's rules are for your benefit. Every time you give into temptation, you are believing a lie. You know, I've been a pastor for over three decades, and over all that time, I've noticed that people tend to ask the same questions. All of these common questions have common solutions, and they're all found in God's Word. So I sat down, and I took the most common questions that I've been asked, and I began to answer them according to scriptures. And I wrote a little book called God's Answers to Life's Difficult Questions. It provides simple, straightforward answers that you can apply right away. You'll discover the simple truths that God has given to us from His Word. And it's just my way of saying thank you for supporting Daily Hope with your financial gifts. Today, when you support Pastor Rick's Daily Hope with a gift to help share the hope of Jesus Christ with people around the world, we'll send you your very own copy of this great resource. So there's always the desire, and then there's the doubt. Did God really say, do I really love, does God really love me? Is it, isn't God just being a little prudish about this? Is it really true? You know, and on and on and on. Then the step three is deception. And the third thing that Satan does is he replaces God's truth with his lie. And he says, God, you won't die if you eat this. God had already said, you eat this fruit, you're going to die. Now, God said, you can eat anything in the whole, in the entire park, Yellowstone Park called Eden. You can eat anything in the park except this one tree. What does man do? He goes immediately to the one tree. It's the minimum amount of temptation possible, but it allows a choice. Satan changes it all. So God says, you can't eat a bunch of stuff. And the reason he doesn't want you to eat it is because he doesn't want you to be as smart as he is. He is giving you a lie. He is, he is deceiving you. Notice it says in that verse, he says, uh, I am lured. He said, temptation comes from the lure of our own evil desire. Circle the word lure. That's a fishing term. He's talking about enticed. He's, he's talking about using bait there. Now, any of you fishermen? Some of you are. The secret of good fishing is real simple. You gotta use the right bait. Salmon eat a certain kind of bait, and trout eat another kind of bait, and, and, and fish will even change what they're eating, feeding on at different times of the day. And how many fish are you gonna catch with a bare hook? None, zero, none. So obviously, you gotta put some bait on there. You gotta have a lure, question. What kind of bait does Satan use on you? Do you even know? Do you know the one he always uses on you? And he keeps coming back to it because it gets you every time. It hooks you every single time. It may be from something a long time ago that a parent said to you. But man, when that thing comes out, you are just so hooked, you immediately get depressed, or you immediately get angry, or you immediately get worried, and Satan, and Satan goes, got her hooked. I put the right bait on that hook. Satan knows your weaknesses, and he hides the hook. Now, I call this phase deception, because you know why? Often, we know there's a hook there, but we still keep nibbling. We know there's a hook but we still keep nibbling. It's like people who flirt in the office. How stupid is that? You know there's a hook there. You know it's gonna, it, there's only one way it could go, bad. But you still keep nibbling. You say, I'm an adult, I won't get hurt, I'll be careful. You're being deceived. And there's a lure. Now, anybody who's done fishing, Tom's a fly fisherman, knows that lures can, when you fly fish, they can be pretty flashy pretty flashy, and the flashier the lure, the, what was that? 
And that fish goes, what was that? <laughs> Holy, I'm going to swim over there. That thing looked, ex it's flashy, it's shiny. Man, that looks like Las Vegas. <laughs> you know what Las Vegas is? One giant lure in the desert. <laughs> and it's shiny, and it's bright, and they've got all you can eat buffets for nothing. And somebody's paying for that. And you're going to get hurt. And, you know, the poor suckers are going to, you know, Las Vegas should just be called lost wages. <laughs> Look at this. Just, next time you're going to attempt to be good at Las Vegas, just give me your money, okay? Just give it to me, okay? <laughs> okay? And then you save the time, save the effort, and we'll use it for good, all right? <laughs> Temptation always looks better than it is. Then step four is disobedience and defeat disobedience and defeat. Now we've moved from desire, there's something that I want, to doubt God's word and God's love, to deception, I'm believing the lie that Satan's telling me, and then you go to disobedience and then defeat, and now it's sin. What began in the mind gets translated into action, and it goes like this. My attention becomes an attitude, and my attitude becomes an action. Well, you really spend a lot of time on this. But this is how it works in the battle for your mind. I've had guys say to me, what's the danger of a harmless fantasy? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? It's not harmless. I want you to write this down. What I flirt with, I'll fall for. Whatever I flirt with, it may be a cupcake. I'll fall for. Whatever I flirt with, I'll fall for. I need to refocus my attention. And the Bible says, after desires conceived, it gives birth to sin, and the end result is death. It says the tragic consequence, what's death? The exact opposite of living. Now listen, you are free to choose anything you want in life. You're free to make your choices, but you are not free from the consequences of those choices. The moment you make that choice, you are no longer free. Because there are consequences that come to every choice, often unintended consequences, and what you sow you will reap, and you cannot choose the behavior and not choose the consequence. Now what am I saying? The best time to win the battle with temptation is before it begins. Look at this verse on the screen. Psalm 119, 112. I have made up my mind to obey your laws forever, no matter what. Until you come to that point, you're just going to keep stumbling and stumbling and stumbling and stumbling. I have made up my mind. That's a choice. I have made up my mind to obey your laws forever, no matter what. All right. Three things I said. You've got to make these choices every day. I have to focus, I have to, I, I have to uh, free, and I have to feed. I said, first, I have to feed my mind constantly on truth, not garbage. And then I have to free my mind from destructive thoughts. We talked about how that happens. And the third is I must focus my mind on the right things. For mental health, I must focus my mind on the right things. Now, we're out of time, so let me just mention three real quick. Just write, can you write quick? All right, just write these down. Three things that'll make the most difference in your mental state. Number one, think about Jesus. Think about Jesus. You've heard that old cliche, you become whatever you think about most. Well, you think about Jesus, guess what you're going to become like? Like Jesus. 2 Timothy 2.8, keep your mind on Jesus Christ. Hebrews 12.13, 12.3, think about Jesus' example. He held on. Are you having a hard time holding on? He held on while wicked people were doing evil things to him. So do not get tired and stop trying. So don't do that. When you start feeling like you're ready to give up, think about what Jesus went through. Think about Jesus. Number two, think about others. Think about others. 
Philippians 2, 4 says, don't just think about your own affairs, but be interested in others too and what they are doing. Do you realize how counterculture that is? Everything in the world teaches you to think about yourself and nobody else. How many times have you heard this phrase? I've gotta do what's best for, for me. Looking out for number one. Yeah, you, I could go on down a whole list of these phrases that basically say, it's all about me, it's all about me, it's all about me, it's all about me. That's why when I wrote Purpose Driven Life, I thought, what's the most counterculture statement I could think of in our culture to begin this book with? And I just said, it's not about you. That is the most counterculture statement you can make in our world today. It's not about you. It's like a slap in the face. So I just thought, I'll start the book with a slap in the face. <laughs> it's not about you, okay? It's not about you, it's not about you, it's not about you. It's all about God. And it's only in giving your life away that you will understand what it really means to live. So think about others. Hebrews 10, 24. Let us think about each other and help each other to show love and do good deeds. Think about Jesus, think about others. Number three, think about eternity. That's the third one that'll make the biggest difference in your mental state. Think about eternity, that there's more to life than just here and now. The problem that we do today is we have short-term thinking. We only think about what's happening right now. Colossians 3, 2, let heaven fill your thoughts. Do not think only about things down here on earth. King James Version says, set your minds on things above, not upon things on the earth. Let heaven fill your thoughts. Now, have you heard this old canard? He's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. That's a bunch of baloney. You know what I found? Only the people who are heavenly minded actually do any good. And those who are most heavenly minded throughout history are those who've done the most good on earth. Bar none. It is not the earthly minded people who get the most done on earth. It is the most heavenly minded people who get the most done on earth for good. It's just not true. He's so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. The problem is the opposite. We're so earthly minded, we're no heavenly good. 1 Corinthians 2.9 no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Think about that. All of the problems, little nitpicky problems in your life are gonna seem so inferior compared to the glory, the joy, the pleasure, the enjoyment, the things we have to look forward to in eternity. I need to feed my mind on truth every day. I need to free my mind from those destructive thoughts. I can choose not to think them by changing the way I think. We'll talk about that in your small group. And then I can focus my mind on the right thing. And when I'm focused on the right thing, I don't have time to pay attention to the wrong thing. When I'm watching a TV, I don't like what I see, I just flip the channel. Change your attention, I'm no longer tempted. It's real simple. Let's bow for prayer. Father, you gave us our minds. We were made in your image. This is the greatest gift you've ever given us, the gift of intellect. And we realize it's our greatest asset, and yet it is the greatest battleground. And we realize that the world and the flesh and the devil all team up to thwart our best intentions. Now you pray. Just say a simple prayer. God, help me to put into practice what I've just learned. Just say, God, help me put into practice what I've just learned. Help me to make these choices on a daily basis. I want to feed my mind with truth all the time. And I want to free my mind from destructive thoughts by taking every thought captive, to make it obedient to Christ, to not just let my mind run wild, 
Help me to be wise to temptation, realize when desire is turning to doubt, to deception, to disobedience. God, today, just say this, God, I'm gonna make up my mind to obey your word forever, no matter what. Help me to think about Jesus. Help me to think about others. Help me to think about eternity, that my life may be truly transformed. In your name I pray, amen. You know, I've been a pastor for over three decades, and over all that time, I've noticed that people tend to ask the same questions. All of these common questions have common solutions, and they're all found in God's Word. So I sat down, and I took the most common questions that I've been asked, and I began to answer them according to scriptures. And I wrote a little book called God's Answers to Life's Difficult Questions. It provides simple, straightforward answers that you can apply right away. You'll discover the simple truths that God has given to us from his word. And it's just my way of saying thank you for supporting Daily Hope with your financial gifts. Today, when you support Pastor Rick's Daily Hope with a gift to help share the hope of Jesus Christ with people around the world, we'll send you your very own copy of this great resource. 